Welcome everyone. My name is Kevin Thomas and I'm one of the managing members at Elevate Oral Care. We are honored today to have three industry experts with significant experience on our topics. Our panel includes Dr. Paul Glassman, DDS, MA, MBA, Professor Emeritus, uh, University of Pacific and Associate Dean for Research and Community Engagement, College of Dental Medicine at California North State University. Dr. Glassman is a recognized expert in change, the changing landscape of oral health delivery, including teledentistry. Next, we have Dr. Matt Allen, DDS, the co-founder and CEO of Different Time. Dr. Allen is a certified motivational interviewing network of trainers and has led many oral health professionals, including our team at Omni, through patient-centered communication skills necessary for true and lasting patient engagement. Our third presenter today is Dr. Jessica Miski, DDS MS, a pediatric dentist from Hastings, Nebraska, and vice chair of the ADA CAP Council, the Council on Advocacy for Access and Prevention. I've gotten to know and respect Dr. Miski for her work in organized dentistry with both the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry and the mentioned CAP Council of the ADA. Her clinical and professional association organizational experience will help uh, will provide valuable perspective for today's topic. Dr. Glassman, let me turn control over to you for our discussion today. Great, thank you, Kevin, for the introduction and thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, I will uh, just jump right in with uh, amplifying the theme that you talked about, which is looking at where we have been and where we're going. And we're gonna hear a little bit about uh, the state of the oral health industry right now, really providing some data that's been developed by other people, but then talk about where we're likely to be going in the short term and long term. So one of the themes that we're gonna explore is this idea of bringing care to where people are and to try to make the case that we really are entering a new era for oral health. So I'm gonna borrow a couple of bits of data from the American Dental Association's Health Policy Institute um, after I do some quick disclosures. So I'm working part-time to start a new dental school in uh, Northern California, which has been a lot of fun for me, but then I do a lot of consulting and I won't read down the whole list of the groups I'm consulting with, both state departments of health and individual providers and in a lot of different parts of the country as this idea of teledentistry uh, expands. So data from the American Dental Association, you can see this is their uh, biweekly uh, survey about what's happening in dental practice across the country. And you can see by looking at that, that dental practices have opened up from a time when almost everything was closed back in uh, in March until really reaching a plateau over about the last month with 98% of dental offices open and also a plateau in about uh, 50% of them fully open and 50% open, but with a lower patient volume. Uh, there's slightly, they're reporting slightly different results in the safety net, where you can see that in public health programs, they're not quite as fully open. They're open, but they're not quite at the same kind of level of patient volume, much more likely to be reporting slower patient volume. And of interest for the topic we're gonna to talk about today, in the safety net, they're reporting less use of, uh, sorry, more use of teledentistry. There was an initial flurry of use, although it didn't get to be widespread, but 24% of uh, practices across the country were reporting they were using teledentistry at a time when offices were closed and dentists were scrambling to figure out how do you maintain some contact with patients. But as offices has opened back up again, that's really dropped off. Um, seems to be a higher utilization in safety net. It's not clear exactly why, but it could be because they're not as fully open as the uh, other parts of the dental industry are. Um, but uh, in spite of, of those data, and in spite of the, the data that shows that the vast majority of the dental industry is open and back to business, it's pretty clear, and this is a study by DentaQuest showing that 98%, 94% of dentists feel like it's not actually back to business as it was before. 94% reported uh, long-term changes that are gonna be impacting the dental industry for a long time. And that includes things like, I, I'm sure everyone's aware of, um, needing to do pre-appointment COVID screenings, whether that's done at the door or in some other way, uh, taking patients' temperature, asking about history of social distancing, et cetera, um, wearing additional PPE, um, all of the inf enhanced infection control procedures. So clearly these things are in effect right now and the sentiment across the country is this will be with us for a long time, a long time to come. 
Uh, as a result of that, there have been a number of groups that have put out various kinds of guidance for the dental industry about what to do in this current area. So this is the American Dental Association's Return to Work Guidance Toolkit, which is uh, pretty spectacular. There's lots of really useful information in there. And the CDC has been putting out various kinds of guidance. Um, one of the things I find interesting, which we'll return to as a theme in today's uh, webinar, is a lot of the things that you look at are, are based on this, or at least allude to this chart from the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH, um, that looks at mitigating hazards. And so as you see, it's an upside down pyramid, where at the uh, bottom of the pyramid is what are referred to as the least effective things to do to mitigate hazards, and at the top are the most effective things to do. And what's been interesting is that in the dental industry, we've been putting almost all of the energy in the dental industry is going into the least effective things to do. This is about PPE and what kind do we wear and how long do we have to wear it for and donning and doffing procedures and, um, and uh, engineering controls and do we need to have airflow systems and what do they need to look like? And if you look at sort of the national publications, chatter, um, webinars, uh, discussion groups, it's almost all around what NIOSH considers to be the least effective controls, a lot less uh, attention to what are the most effective controls, which are just to do things that just eliminate the hazard entirely. So, um, you know, we're going to be asking the question and trying to give some insight on it. Are we talking about uh, short-term strategies that need to be altered? And then how does that all imply um, the future for the dental industry in terms of long-term strategies? So with that sort of look at what's happening now, um, uh, just one really quick slide about data in terms of the dental industry. Long-term, we know that the dental industry has not been reaching most of the people in the country with the services that potentially could offer. So this is again from the American Dental Association's Health Policy Institute, looking at who's getting dental care in our country. The data has altered slightly since this graph was created, but the highest utilizers of children are, highest utilizers of dental services are children. Um, now it's a little over 50%, it was a little under 50% at the time this data was collected. But still, we're talking about um, around half the children in the country not getting even an annual dental visit. And we all know an annual dental visit is a pretty low bar for thinking about are people getting good dental health or not. And even less than that for seniors and only about a third of working age adults um, getting dental care. And this data is mixing all of the economic and social strata together. So if you look at people from diverse communities, people of lower income, it gets very skewed so that a lot of this is represented by a lot better utilization among higher income people and more majority populations than among other groups in the country. So I just summarize all of this data uh, this way, which is that the current dental care system is primarily serving the wealthiest and healthiest segments of the population. The people that are most likely to be going into dental offices now are the most affluent people, the people who understand the most about how to care for their teeth, the people with the least disease, and those people with most disease are less likely to be going into dental offices and taking advantage of what the dental care industry has to offer. So a path forward that we've been talking about now for a long time and is getting increasing attention is this three-part diagram, which shows that uh, the path forward includes measurement and payment systems that will provide incentives and rewards for providers and provider entities and systems that pay attention to increasing the health of the population, sort of moving away from volume-based systems and encourage us doing a lot of stuff to value-based systems that really start to pay more attention to the outcome. Lots of groups in the oral health industry looking very carefully at that and figuring out ways to increasingly in, put that into part of how we deliver healthcare. Also, we have increased attention about delivery systems. How do we get to all the people who are not getting dental care on a regular basis? And not the only strategy, and one of them is teledentistry, which we'll focus on in a minute. And then the third one is prevention and behavior science. We have lots of really spectacular new science now that can help us think differently about dental care. Um, the prevention and behavior science includes what I titled this slide as the declining role for the dental drill, all of the things we know about remineralization and caries resting medications and sealing caries and uh, Elevate and others have sponsored numerous uh, webinars and other kinds of information about how to use all these, these new tools and methods. The point I think I want to make a point about them now is that all of these new tools, methods and materials are things that change the dynamics of treating dental disease that when I was in dental school, to be able to treat these two little, I call them little divots on those uh, central incisors, there was nothing to do except for reach for a dental drill and drill those out and put a conventional filling in. And now there's all kinds of things that can be done. And the, in, the most important things, there's all kinds of things that can be done without needing a dental office, without needing a dental drill, 
and without actually needing a dentist. A dentist might be involved through a telehealth system and making some kind of diagnosis or treatment recommendations, but the actual treatment can be done in a community setting, can be done by allied personnel. So that's dramatically shifted our thinking about how we can create systems that can improve the oral health of the population. The other major thing under prevention of behavior science is, of course, um, support for adoption of mouth healthy habits. And I won't say much about that now because Matt Allen's going to um, be focusing on that in just a couple minutes. The only thing I'll just say about it is the principles we understand, particularly the bottom three on this chart, um, coaching people to make small incremental changes, checking very frequently how they're doing, ongoing reinforcement and, and additional coaching. It's just impossible to do that. Through, the, through a dental office. You're just not seeing people often enough. The people who need most of this counseling are not even in dental offices except for an occasional emergency visit. So really, it really does push us to think about partnering with community organizations that are in touch with people. All right, so now let's focus then on delivery systems and what's been happening in the world of teledentistry. Since teledentistry actually started to, to um, be used, uh, I was involved in a very early project close to 18 years ago. It's really blossomed and the recognition of it has blossomed. We've got all kinds of companies that are starting, all kinds of systems that are being deployed. I've broken them down on this slide for, for maybe four different categories. Um, some people are doing, I call advice and referral. That can be as simple as a dentist responding to a photograph sent to them by a patient. Um, there are call center companies that advertise you uh, make an appointment, you pay some money, you can talk to a dentist 24 hours a day. Typically, that results in maybe some advice and then a referral to a brick and mortar dental office. You have some people going out into community sites. I call it limited on site care on the slide, where they're doing some things in the community, but often that results in a referral to a brick and mortar dental office as well. And then you have full service care systems that are actually focusing on trying to make the community the center of care and using the dental office as the place where the advanced surgical services can be provided really turning on its head the idea of the dental office being the center of the dental universe, but very much connected with dental offices and those first service, those full service systems so that the dentist who's a part of the team is actually there, has reviewed the records, and when the person comes to the office, they're not starting it over with another exam. They're actually taking advantage of all the work that's been done with the community. So a full service connected team. Um, I'll run through a couple of slides very quickly. Um, some of you are familiar with this. So I won't spend much time on it. one of these full service systems that we've developed in California and now being practiced in a lot of other states. We call it the virtual dental home. Virtual in that name being we're trying to uh, demonstrate, which we now have, that all of the principles that can be uh, you can see in a in a dental home are um, are being used. But we're doing it in a we call it geographically distributed telehealth connected team. So different people, different places connected through a telehealth system and perform, providing that full service system of care. Um, we have uh, in some implementations, a dental hygienist and an assistant who are using portable equipment. They can be one place one day, another place another day, capturing uh, images like here radiographs and then photographs and really populating uh, a full electronic record for all of the images, charting, health history, consent forms, everything that you would have in a fully electronic dental record system that was done in an office. Uh, I won't walk through the entire workflow here, but just to say that the dental record collection is done by these allied personnel in the community. Data goes up into a uh, cloud-based system. There's a dentist who's not on site who's able to get into the cloud-based system, review the records, and the dentist is able to make a decision about whether, in fact, that uh, patient, um, whether it's a child in with school or an adult in a daycare center or a nursing home, whether that patient needs to come into the dental office because they have some things that are just too complicated to be done by the hygienist in the community or whether the hygienist can actually take care of everything that's needed to be done in the community site. So we did an initial demonstration of this idea across California in 15 different communities and about 50 different sites. Um, and we're clearly able to demonstrate that we could make this idea of telehealth connected teams work. We could have dental hygienists who here were placing interim therapeutic restorations, which is now allowed in California and some other states, um, in addition to the traditional preventive procedures and the examination done by the dentist. They were able to take this tooth, which in a low-income child often results in uh, nothing, no care at all, until they have a toothache and are not learning in school and then ending up in, uh, in, the, in the emergency room or the hospital in 15 minutes or so, and they can now seal that decay in place. These are long-term restorations although the title that's been used in the United States is interim therapeutic restorations, uh, they are as they can last as long as conventional restorations. They need to be monitored like every other restoration, but they can have a long-term impact. 
So we were able to clearly show that uh, we could make this idea of telehealth connected teams work. Um, some of the high level take homes from that uh, initial study were that we could actually reach people who are not getting regular care, emphasize prevention, lower costs. Um, and most people, the majority actually, could be kept and verified healthy on site. Verified is an important word because uh, we certainly didn't invent school-based care, for example. But for example, in a sealant program where a dental hygienist might be placing sealants, they're obligated to tell the parent, uh, we didn't do a complete exam, so now you need to go to a dental office for the exam. Well, in this system, you're able to verify, do the complete exam, verify they're healthy, and uh, save everyone a lot of unnecessary trips to an office that really don't have to be done. And in fact, um, the majority of children in this study, about two thirds of them, could be kept healthy by just the services of the hygienist with the dentist involved through the telehealth system. Um, that was before we did this before we had silver diamine fluoride in the United States. And so now we know that it's up to, uh, we're estimating around 80% of children. If you think about that, isn't that just a spectacular difference for a low income school district where most kids are not getting care to keep 80% of them healthy on site? It's just a huge game changing, game changing difference. So um, it gives us some things to think about in terms of where we're going for the future. You know, the idea of teledentistry as a way of reaching populations who don't get traditional care has been growing since we first started doing this in California. And I'll skip the slides with the various progression, but now across the country, you have more and more states. Uh, this It's even hard to keep this graph updated because there's so many new states beginning to pass laws and create a policy environment where the kind of things we were talking about can be done. So we're entering an era where we're really starting these golden rings of uh, rewards for uh, paying attention to population health, delivery systems and prevention and, and behavior science are beginning to make really a big impact. We're getting to a point where we can start to think about um, the value in uh, what we are now calling community engaged oral health systems. So again, instead of, instead of thinking about dental care as happening in an office, you can start to think of a community engaged oral health system where the office is an important part of it, but it's not the only place where care is taking place. And um, so that's an idea that's beginning to grow. Uh, I'm predicting that's gonna have a huge impact on oral health delivery in the future as people begin to think more and more about the value of these community engaged systems. But of course, we're on a little bit of a detour right now. Um, we are uh, faced with this pandemic. And um, again, the idea, I wanna come back to what I said earlier, that we have a lot of attention now towards the sort of least effective uh, modalities in this NIOSH hierarchy of controls and say a little bit about what the options are for us to think about the top of the most effective things. So think about this next slide as a dental office, an office now which can be put into place right now, and I think will be increasingly part of dental offices in the future. So you certainly have something we didn't have to think about so much in the, pa in the past, but you have, for example, maybe some parts of the office are turned into some highly modified operatories where you have to pay attention to airflow, you have to pay attention to a very strict um, airborne infection control, all the donning and doffing of PPE. You're not gonna be, have a dentist bouncing from one operatory to another. By the time you put on all the effective gear, you're gonna go into the operatory, you're gonna stay there until you're done. It really does have an impact on slowing down uh, production capacity. Um, but we're also starting to see a growing recognition that all dental care doesn't have to be provided that way. And so now we're having offices turn towards maybe even part of the office dedicated to more minimally invasive procedures the office that those parts of the office don't have to be as clearly walled off and have all the same kind of protections as places where you're producing aerosols and an increasing understanding you can keep a lot of people healthy by using minimally invasive procedures that we just talked about earlier and then the other part of this office of the future is the uh, the cloud here i call it the bright cloud because it's about using a teledentistry system to be able to uh, not only uh, um, reach people outside, but particularly in this diagram, it actually facilitate pre and post visit care. All the things you can do to keep some people from needing to come into the office and maybe some people who might be able to come in for shorter visits. So uh, I just wanna illustrate a little bit about, about that. Um, the, uh, we're, we're actually doing a, a study, a university study now, starting out with just an opinion survey. And we're asking people two questions. This is the first question is, how many visits could you eliminate if you were to, and that's really obviously at the very top of the hierarchy of controls, to totally eliminate the, the risk of, of passing on disease if a person's not coming into the office. How many visits could you eliminate if you were to start to use a teledentistry system for post-operative evaluations? 
for maybe problem focused evaluation. Some people you talk to them and what they really need is some advice. They don't actually have to come in. A treatment plan presentation. You know, in the current environment, you have someone come into your office for a treatment plan presentation. Both the dentist and the patient are wearing a mask. You can't see the patient's facial expressions. You don't know when they're smiling or frowning. You might be able to say you can do a more effective treatment plan presentation over a video conference than you could in person. And and not alone, let alone all of the uh, lessons of the uh, lessening risk of infection. Um, other kinds of problems that don't need a visit. Guided oral health care instructions. So a lot of things that can be done without the patient needing to come in. Some estimates were getting 20 to 50 percent. Uh, 50 percent is a bit on the high side, I think. One pediatric dentist said, you know, half the patients that I come into my office, I just talk to them. I don't actually, actually have to do anything or touch them. So maybe we're seeing more commonly people saying 20 to 30 percent of visits could be eliminated by uh, the not, not eliminating care, eliminating the visit into the office. And then we also asked the question, how many patients could have a shorter visit? And that would be doing things like a pre- uh, using a video conference or a pre-telehealth telehealth system, understanding the patient's concerns, setting their expectation for what's gonna happen during the visit, updating their demographics and insurance information, updating their health history, um, explaining the procedures that are gonna take place, getting consent, um, uh, talking to them about minimally invasive procedures that are gonna take place when they come into the office. Again, we're getting estimates of 20 to 50%, more commonly in the 20 to 30% range. But if you could, if you could eliminate it 20 or 30% of visits and you could shorten 20 or 30%, and just think about what, what a difference that would make in dental practices now and going forward. Um, less invasive procedures being done, less PPE, less crowded appointment books, lower in-office costs, less infection risk, and certainly patients are going to be really appreciative of being able to be in a dental care treatment environment that uh, realizes the potential of all this. And then, of course, once an office gets the idea and starts to figure out how to use an effective telehealth connection to their patients, then it opens up the possibility of making connections with the community and being able to have potentially part of the team in places listed on the slide here, like businesses or schools or other kinds of places, but connected to the office through the telehealth team. So some parts of the team are in the community, some parts of the team are in the office, but to connect them together through a telehealth system. And a couple of benefits, if, you, if, if as people start to do more and more of this, um, think about, for example, uh, just in, in areas where there aren't dental offices, like for example, a rural community, um, it's really hard for a dentist to think about opening an office in a place like that. Typically, they don't because the economics are just not there. It's just hard to make a living in an area where there isn't that big a population density. But if a dentist were to think about having their uh, their office, their surgical suite here, but have a small office, not fully equipped, but just where a dental hygienist could do the diagnostic and prevention, early intervention work, and it could be a, an, an unused office in a in a medical facility or something that's used only occasionally or a drugstore or some other kind of place and uh, working with that dentist in the system we just discussed and another one here and maybe scattered around that uh, uh, rural area and then all these connected to the central office so that the dentist actually is in contact with people throughout the region but uh, only occasionally the people need to come into the office for community for uh, for actual surgical care now you have a viable practice that can actually afford to have a dentist and be able to be there um, you start to open up the possibility for all kinds of new workflow ideas. I won't work through this whole diagram, but the idea of using the telehealth system as a way to gather information, to have all the pre- and post-operative visits. You start to think about looking for really full-service teledentistry visits. Some people are now, I think, uh, dabbling with partial things like Zoom or other kinds of video systems. But if you start to think about a full system that has all these components in it, it really lends itself to being able to have a system like I just talked about. And then you can really start to emphasize and realize the value of uh, the minimally invasive procedures, all of the remineralization procedures and medications and materials that are out there now. We can start to really be able to uh, move towards uh, realizing these golden rings of the future of dental care and begin to build this idea of community engaged oral health systems. So with that, I'm going to stop and we're going to turn it over to Matt to talk about uh, communication systems and how we think differently about our relationships with our patients in this in this new world. So I will uh, stop sharing my screen and uh, Steve, let you turn that over to Matt to share his screen at this point. And Matt, you're on mute, so I can't hear you yet. Thank you, Paul. Right, Hello, great. everyone. Good to, good to see you. I'm excited to, to be with you all today. And Paul, thank you for for setting me up there. Um, I am excited to, to chat kind of a little bit about 
something that I think is just going to be a really big part of the new world uh, post COVID and, and why that might be and, and how we might be able to actually accomplish that. Something that I think is really grounded in something all of us uh, who got into dentistry probably wanted to achieve when we started our journey here. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes those can get sidetracked and distracted a little bit. And so today we're really going to talk about the value of, of our relationships with patients, how we communicate with them, and, and really kind of understand that the way we talk to our patients and how we show them that we care for them can really make a big difference between oral disease and true oral health. And so with that, I will share my screen here. I'm gonna jump off just so you don't have to try to look at me and the slides uh, while I am talking. Um, but yeah, I'll turn off my webcam and I'll share my screen and we'll walk through what I have to talk about. All right, so let's see here. Stop that. Oh, there we go. And here we go. All right. So uh, one of the things that I, that I was thinking about as, we, as I got ready for this was just the idea that we do a lot of chemotherapeutic prevention in our practices. We work really hard on thinking about things like 5,000 part per million toothpaste, or we work really hard at thinking about new technologies like silver diamine fluoride and, and other technologies, uh, chemotherapeutic technologies that en enable prevention. And so I kind of started asking myself, well, you know, the, the kind of work that, that I generally do is focused on communication and is focused on relationship building and partnership building. D does that actually have an impact on prevention? And, and we'll, we'll take a look at that in just a second. But before I get started, I want to make sure that you know uh, a little bit about who I am, just like Paul did, so you can decide whether to trust me or not. Uh, I'll try to do my best to stay unbiased and uh, you know clear uh, with regards to the evidence, but want to make sure that you guys know who I am. So uh, I do have several of my own companies. Uh, different kind is focused on helping patients uh, kind of it, take take control of their patient experience. M David M I is, is helps dental professionals uh, learn some of these skills, and we'll talk about those today. I have done some consulting for DentaQuest Partnership for Oral Health and for Elevate um, as well. I am still a clinician. Um, and I am faculty at uh, the University of Colorado School of Dental Medicine. So that is who I am. I live in Colorado. I'm excited to be with you today. So let's go to that question then that I was asking myself. Does empathy affect outcomes? I think that's a really good question. Is the way that I approach my patients um, and how I show that care for them, does that affect outcomes? We'll take a look at dentistry in just a minute, but I want to first focus on a couple studies from medicine. And so as we get back to kind of cold and flu season, really great study done a few years ago, 700 clinical encounters. Patients who reported that their clinicians had a perfect empathy score were much more likely to report that their colds lasted fewer days and were less severe. And not only that, just from patient reported outcomes, but also they had a higher change in nasal neutrophils and cytokines IL-8. So the chemistry and the biochemistry is following along with the patient reported outcomes as well. Pretty interesting. Uh, in Germany, they did a similar study with cancer patients. Physician empathy was positively associated with an improvement in patient reported outcomes of depression and quality of life. So when people have cancer, their physicians are showing empathy, they're saying, hey, I'm doing better every day. That's huge, uh, especially in this world of COVID that we're living in where depression and quality of life are are being impacted for people, we can have an impact on that. Uh, in diabetes, several different studies, big studies, 20,000 patients showing less acute metabolic complications and better control of A1C and good uh, LDL control as well. So in diabetes outcomes, both in bad, you know, avoiding bad outcomes and having the positive ones, physician empathy positively reported or positively correlated with those outcomes. And lastly, in thinking about things like mental health, being treated with cognitive behavioral therapy, therapeutic empathy, so how the uh, psychologist or the psychiatrist treated their patients had a moderate to large causal effect on recovery from depression. So people are getting better because of the way that their physician treated them. To me, that's fascinating. I think that's great. Um, so what about dentistry though? Does it, does it, is the same thing happening in dentistry? Well, let's take a quick look at a couple of different studies. So the first study that I want to talk about was done 
in the UK came out earlier this year in the Journal of Dental Research. It was called the Dental Recur Trial. And what they did was they took a look at kids uh, who were going in for an extraction. So five to seven year olds who are going in for an extraction and either they had a half an hour conversation with a dental nurse, they call them, so essentially a dental assistant, or they had you know, just kind of standard, you go into the hospital, you get your extraction done under general anesthesia, and you go back to your general dentist. So both of, you know, that was the, the difference, one half an hour conversation. And then they followed up two years later after that one half an hour conversation. And what did they find? Well, the odds of new caries experience occurring were reduced by 51% in the group that had had that one half an hour conversation. So I totally agree with what Paul said earlier that we need constant and more contact with our patients. And so we might not necessarily be the best person to have these conversations with our patients all the time, uh, because it might be more helpful for some, like somebody at their school, for example, uh, if we're talking about kids to have that conversation with them, or maybe it's uh, a primary care physician or somebody like that, that they might be seeing more frequently. But that notwithstanding, that might, we might not be the best person, it still had a huge impact, one half an hour conversation. And how often might we say, oh, this one conversation that I have with my patients isn't going to make a difference. Here we're seeing new caries odds reduced by a lot um, when they simply took the time to have one conversation with patients. To me, that's fascinating. Let's look at another trial from this year. This is done in Hong Kong, and essentially they looked at motivational interviewing with early childhood caries. And going back to the question, does empathy affect this? So both of these use the style and skills of motivational interviewing. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. If you just got your uh, JADA, new September JADA, you'll see motivational interviewing on the cover. Motivational interviewing specifically says, hey, empathy is a really important part of this. There are also some style and skills then to kind of implement that empathy. Uh, so these aren't necessarily just saying, hey, physician empathy, but use, utilizing a technique and a style and skills that have empathy kind of built into it um, is really what these two studies are looking at. And so what did this study from Hong Kong find? I think this is really fascinating. Let's look. Integration of motivational interviewing improves the effectiveness of prevailing health education in preventing early, ch early childhood caries, enhancing parental efficacy, and improving child's oral health behaviors. So less caries, parents are better equipped to deal with it, children are doing more things that are going to keep their mouth healthy, which is just like Paul said, those mouth healthy habits, right? And we want those mouth healthy habits to then lead to good outcomes, because we know that there are several studies out there that have looked at this and said, well, does that actually make a difference? And, and I'll talk about that in just a little bit. It do, do, you know, better behaviors actually always lead to good outcomes. And, and we'll take a look at that in just a little bit. So if the answer to that question then of does empathy affect outcomes, if we can answer that in the affirmative, then I think the next question that we might want to ask ourselves is, so what, what can I do? What, what, you know, what am I supposed to do moving forward to help my patients? Especially in this time where things are crazy, everyone is feeling really overwhelmed. How can I, especially maybe via teledentistry, have a conversation with my patient? They don't have to necessarily come into the office. I could have a conversation with my patient that could help promote oral health for them. That's to me, that's amazing, and I think it's something that we can and probably all should do. So what can I do? And I want to offer you three specific ways that I think that you can learn um, to adopt some of the style and skills that this empathy will promote and that will help your patients uh, stay healthy. So three different ideas here. First, learn and apply the style and skills of motivational interviewing. Uh, to me, you know, we look at the systematic reviews that are coming out. I'm part of uh, the committee from the ADA that's helping craft uh, a new guideline that should hopefully come out next year around behavior management and looking at this specifically. So we'll see exactly what that says. But when I look at the thrust of the evidence and when I look at the thrust of the evidence for chronic disease in general, there is good evidence saying, hey, MI is effective. Of course, you can find studies that don't necessarily show that. Um, and I want to offer two thoughts just on, the, on that as well. This is definitely not a panacea and it's not a silver bullet. Just like SDF, you know, it prevents a lot of cavities, but it doesn't prevent all of them. And so it take it really does take a multi-pronged approach to prevent and treat any chronic disease, not just caries, not just periodontal disease. So what we really want to do for our patients is not just say, well, I'm just going to use SDF or I'm just going to use MI or I'm just going to use something else. What we want to say is, what are all the things that we can really do that are going to help our patients stay healthy? And so I would say 
that motivational interviewing has some good evidence behind it to really uh, support that. And then second, I think in science in general, we're really interested in isolating variables to find out what works and what doesn't, especially in research. And in chemotherapeutics, we're attempting to isolate biological and chemical factors, and we have a little bit more control over that. In behavioral science, we're attempting to isolate sociological factors, which is much harder. And in some of these MI studies, especially where they're finding no difference between that and conventional health education, they're working with people who have extremely complex and difficult lives, extremely difficult things that are going on every single day. And oral health might not be the top of their priority list. They might not be able to get groceries uh, at all because the closest grocery store is a gas station that's 45 minutes away, doesn't have any healthy food. So even if they wanted to eat healthy food, it's really just not a possibility for them. So it's hard, if not impossible, to, to kind of maintain these other variables, which I mean, essentially are the great complexity of life itself and kind of simultaneously study MI alone and say, does MI work You know, if you keep everything else the same? Because everything else just doesn't stay the same. So I think that kind of brings us back to point number one. It helps, uh, it's not a panacea. Let's use it in conjunction with a whole bunch of other things. So uh, one of the big questions that I always get is, well, I think I'm kind to my patients. I think I'm generally helpful for them. What does this sound like? And so over the past few years, we've worked really hard to help create some videos uh, of what this does look like and sound like. And so I just wanna show you a short clip uh, right now of one of the videos that we created last year, thinking about some of these mouth healthy habits, these behaviors that really do impact health. And we'll kind of see, okay, this is, my, this is what this might sound like. There are specifics here. Um, we could, we're not gonna necessarily get into those, but if you're interested in learning more about this, we can certainly talk and help you kind of understand, here's the kinds of things that you might wanna do that, that would promote a conversation that sounds like this. So let's take a quick right, look at that. And so having finished looking at your x-rays, having finished kind of doing your clinical exam, I know you've been coming here for a long time. We really appreciate that. One of the things that we always try to do here in our office is make sure that we stay the most up to date as we can on evidence and knowing what's happening out there in, in the world of you know making sure that you're getting the, the highest quality evidence out there and that in your treatment. Um, one of the things that we've seen in the last few years and kind of this big news flash that's come through dentistry is this idea of helping patients understand their risk for getting new cavities. Um, we know that some people are at lower risk and, and some people are at higher risk. Um, and so you heard uh, the hygienist earlier talk a little bit about, you know, hey, we want to have some a question with, uh, conversation with you and ask some questions uh, to you about, you know, what your risk might be. Um, so I'd love to maybe just talk with you about where your risk is at, and then as we think through that, what you might be able to do to you know help you get to that goal of avoiding cavities, ha avoiding having problems in the future, keeping your teeth long term. So how does all that sound? Okay, sounds good. Cool. Um, so I think overall everything is looking good. I don't see any new cavities. You haven't had a cavity in a long time, which is fantastic. Um, I would say you're probably right in the middle in terms of your risk, somewhere in the moderate level. Um, and that's probably mostly due just to your habit of drinking soda um, pretty consistently throughout the day. A lot of the other things are really good. It's probably just the soda that's kind of putting you at risk for, for developing some cavities in the future. So how do you feel about that when you kind of hear that? Um, I guess I didn't realize that was such a risk. Uh, okay. So you weren't super aware that soda no. Could be causing no, I mean, a problem or putting your usually risk has together. sugar, but so that's that's kind of the one you're avoiding all the other sugars, but right. Well, I need caffeine somewhere, so okay, yeah. <laughs> I get it for my soda. Gotcha. So when you think about soda and then kind of wanting to avoid cavities in the future and understanding you're at moderate, how do, you know how does that make you feel? How what are what are your thoughts on your soda habit when you put it in that context? Um, you know, I'd rather not be moderate risk. I'd rather be a little lower risk because I think I do take pretty good care of my teeth. Okay. So keeping your teeth healthy is maybe a little bit more important to you than I think so. drinking yeah. as many maybe sodas as you yeah, are right now. I guess now. so, if you put it that way. Okay. So, you know, thinking about then maybe wanting to decrease that risk and, and maybe avoid drinking soda a little bit, it sounds like, what do you think you could do then to maybe help you you know, drink a little bit less soda, what might you drink instead or whatever? Um, I guess I could make an attempt to drink more water. Okay. Um, trying to be healthy. Okay. Yeah, you're trying to be healthy in a lot of other ways in yeah, your life so too. and That would cut calories too, so that would be good. Okay, so not only for your teeth, but for your whole body. Exactly. It affects your systemic health as well. 
Cool. Um, okay, so drinking a little bit more water um, could be helpful for you there, and you feel like you could you could do that. That's something you I feel. I could probably substitute one or two sodas for a glass of water. Okay, great. So you're willing to kind of cut that down by one or yeah. two. Yeah. Awesome. Well, if you want, we, we're happy to touch base with you next time, check in with you, see how that's going. Um, we can certainly give you lots of high fives if it's going well. If it's not, hey, no judgment. Um, we're here to support you and help you and walk through it with you. So, um, yeah, we'd love to maybe touch base with you next time. Okay. Does that sound good? Yeah, thanks. Perfect, yeah. I'd love to also maybe just talk about a couple of things that we could do, you know, here as well, other options that you might have as well to help you decrease that risk, because certainly soda is one of those things that, um, you know, puts you at a little bit higher risk, but some other, you know, preventative things that you could do as well um, here in the office and at home as well. So. Okay. Great. Um, well, I think one of the first things that we could do is put some fluoride on in the office here for you. Um, you know, normally we can, we, you've probably had that at a few of your visits, but we can put that on a couple times a year for you when you come in for your exams or your cleanings, uh, and that can help decrease your risk as well. Um, we know from the evidence that that can be effective. So how does that feel to you? That sounds fine. Cool. We have different flavors, so you can pick which one you like and which one works the best for you. A soda flavor. <laughs> soda flavor, perfect, I love it. Um, I don't know if we have soda. Um, the other thing that we could maybe do as well, um, you know, you're using fluoride toothpaste at home, which is great. We have some stronger toothpaste as well, uh, essentially that has even more fluoride in it, and that can really help to, you know, reverse the, the effects of, you know, the sodas or anything in your diet that might be causing, you know, the starts of cavities and things like that. So if you wanted to, um, we could help, you know, get you some stronger toothpaste uh, that would be more effective even at, at fighting those cavities off and make your teeth strong. So how does that sound to you? So I would just switch out my toothpaste. You got it. Yeah. Instead of using your regular toothpaste, you could use this twice a day. We have it right up front, something that you could take home today if you want and you just use it just like your regular toothpaste. You would brush with it, spit it out, and then don't rinse so that that residue stays on your teeth as long as possible. So what do you think? I think I could do that. Okay, perfect. Um, well, like I said, we'd be happy to set you up with that at the front. And, um, but I think those two things combined, uh, along with your decreased uh, soda intake that you, that you want to achieve, I think we could make some really big progress in helping you decrease that risk and keeping you cavity-free long-term. That sounds great. Perfect. Well, thanks for chatting with me about it. I really appreciate it. All right, thanks. Yeah. All right. So if the first answer then is learn and apply the style and skills of motivational interviewing, I think the second thing that we can do, which is certainly related to this, is employ self-management support strategies. And this really comes from the idea that we know, especially for behaviors, that it's what patients do at home, right? And it's not what we tell them to do, it's what they're actually doing. And that's really self-management, it's how the patient is doing it. So we can sit there and say, you need to brush your teeth better, um, and that might be what we consider patient education in quotes. But a patient who says, I want to brush my teeth better, well, now they're the ones who are kind of owning that goal and taking more control of that. And we know that, especially in managing chronic disease, like caries, like periodontal disease, that patients who are informed and activated, essentially doing the things that they want to do at home, have better health outcomes. And often they don't need to come into the office as much. So we can take care of more of those people who really do need our services. We might be able to have these conversations, like Paul said, via teledentistry, and it might not have to be us. It could be a hygienist or it could be even be a dental assistant thinking about uh, people in the community who they trust. So for these reasons, it's really important though that we think about how we can provide effective self-management support. And there are lots of different ways to do this. There's a great uh, article that just came out in a nursing journal actually to talking about improving self-management support and it said practitioners need a digital repository of services and resources so one of the things that I think especially in dentistry with regards to that is knowing all the options available and we'll talk a little bit about what that is uh, looks like in just a minute they need motivational interviewing skills an understanding of the optimum duration and pattern of consultations which we might want to see our high-risk patients a little bit more. And we might not be able to do that right now with the pandemic. So maybe we do have to utilize something like teledentistry to stay in touch with those patients who do need our support more. And lastly, incentivize targets that match the biopsychosocial model of care. So thinking about care, not just as primarily biomedical, but biopsychosocial. It's the things that we do and it's the way that we think about it. Um, and that was kind of going to the measurement and payment systems that Paul was talking about earlier. Now, are there tools out there that we can employ and utilize right now that would help us to actually employ these self-management support strategies? Uh, and I wouldn't ask the question if I didn't have an answer for you. So I would like to say yes. And here's one example of this. So this is an example of what we call a self-management goal menu. Essentially ask the question at the top, what can I do to prevent cavities? And 
Is my screen paused? Sorry. Is it, is it looking good still, everyone? Can someone tell me? We, we are. I'm seeing a uh, the, the video. So the video stopped. Ah, there we go. There we go. Sorry. Yeah. Now, now you can see the self-management goal menu. Thank you. Uh, good thing I had the preview in the top right corner there. Appreciate that. Um, so what can I then do to prevent cavities um, in, in this self-management goal menu? Asking questions like, what are your oral health goals? Helping you ask questions like this with patients and helping the patient see, hey, the more you input you have in choosing your goals, the more likely you are to achieve them. So what might some things, uh, might, what might be some things that you want to do in the office? Again, helping patient understand their options, saying, oh, wow, I didn't even know sealants might be an option for me or, oh, more frequent dental visits. Tell me why I might need that versus some things that I might be able to do at home. Oh, there are prescriptions that I can use. Most patients might not even know that exists. And so this is a helpful way of, for us to help them understand their options, but then also say, well, yeah, I think I could brush with that 5,000 part per million toothpaste. And I think I could use that. That wouldn't be a problem for me because um, essentially it's just the same toothpaste. It's not a big deal. Um, so this, these can be really helpful. You can use these in settings like teledentistry. You can obviously use these in office, uh, but these tools are available and out there for you. And again, we could probably follow up um, in, in the email with some of these tools if you're interested in, in seeing more of what that might look like to help you facilitate those self-management support conversations with your patients. And then lastly, the last thing that I kind of want to prove, or kind of just put out the idea here, and this kind of goes to those that option uh, conversation, is help patients make clinical decisions that align with their values and preferences via what's called shared decision making. And we'll talk just a little bit about what shared decision making is in just a minute. But essentially, the idea is that, uh, excuse me, the idea is that we want to help the patients know what's out there and then allow the patients to choose from reasonable options. It's not my responsibility as the dentist to say, hey, you need this. Um, going back to the, that, you know, the, what call, Paul called the divots on that, one, uh, on that one tooth, to say, hey, here are the different options. Of course, a filling is an option there, um, but what are the different options? And let's help the patients pick the ones that align best with their values and preferences. If you just put SDF on that tooth, and those teeth looked black, is that gonna matter to the patient? It might not, it may, but until we have that conversation around what the patient values, we're not gonna be able to help them elect a treatment decision that's in line with those values and preferences. So what does that really look like? Well, I, I like this quote here from the National Institute for, Healthcare, uh, for Health and Care Excellence in the UK, essentially saying, hey, look, shared decision-making is just us working together and it puts people at the center of their decisions, true person-centered care about their own treatment and care. And so what you hear, see here at the bottom is a decision aid that essentially helps people decide what might be most important to them. So you can see here, well, maybe someone says, hey, you know what, I wanna talk about first, I don't want needles at all if possible. Um, and so that's the most important thing to me. I wanna find an option that really avoids needles. Okay, well, maybe then we're talking about SDF only or maybe something like a smart filling that might help you avoid needles while still treating a cavity that your kid has. And so you can see that there's different topics of conversation here that really can facilitate patients choosing things, which is obviously going to make them more satisfied, but it will make them more activated in their care and generally will improve, improve outcomes as well uh, when patients are the ones involved in choosing those decisions. So I wanna close by coming back to one of my favorite studies on this topic. And it came out in 2012 and was done in Australia. And essentially what they did is they essentially said, what matters to you patients when you go to see the dentist? And apart from some kind of technical level of competence, right? We all want technical competence with our dentists. I just wanna read several different quotes from patients that I think really land with this and really help us see exactly what patients want when they come to the dentist. So I do not have the knowledge of a dentist, but the dentist acknowledges that I am a person of intelligence as well. We don't want to condescend to people. So I suppose it's how the dentist explains the information without making me feel like the dentist has been speaking to me condescendingly. Oof, man, if we just simply take that moment to say, hey, this person has a lot of knowledge, a lot of expertise in themselves, that can be a huge step in terms of creating and building that partnership. Same study. As with most things in a two-way relationship, it's the gentleness, it's the trust, it's the respect, it's the actual transparency that has being able to build up a relationship where you can trust your dentist to give you a very open and honest answer about any treatment. Helping our patients understand risks, benefits, alternatives, 
things like that is a crucial part of us moving forward into this new era of care where we're not simply the kind of paternalistic decision makers. We are partners with our patients as we make these decisions. And lastly, I have dropped Dennis in the past. I think that they were how they were able to relate to me as a person was probably the biggest indicator of whether I felt comfortable with what they were doing. I suppose if you have a choice of five people with the same skill set, it is how they are able to deliver that skill set that is more important than the skill set as such. So a patient is seeing five dentists on the Google search that they're doing. And what they're saying, what this patient is saying here is, well, I'm seeing them as having all of the same skill set. They're all dentists to me, but how they are able to communicate with me, how they're able to respond to my preferences, my values, the things that I want is going to be probably the most important indicator of whether or not I'm going to stay with this dentist long term. And especially in this era where maybe we're not seeing our patients as much as possible. If we have these kinds of skills, I think our patients will come back to us more in the future when things do return to some semblance of normal, and we will be more likely to be able to help continue with them along the road to oral health in the long term. So one, one little story here as I close. So Atul Gawande uh, did a, had a, a lecture series a couple of years ago called uh, Why Doctors Fail, which I think is an interesting title for a lecture series. Uh, and in the third lecture series, he, he talked about this study that they did at Mass General where they took patients who had stage four incurable lung cancer. So these patients on average live just 11 months and half got usual oncology care and then half got oncology care. Plus they saw a palliative care physician essentially to kind of help them die who would discuss with them what their priorities and goals were for their end of life. And what they saw between the two groups to me was fascinating. They saw that the group who had that palliative care physician, so they have chemotherapy, right? The best kind of you know, technical care you can possibly want. But the patients who had those conversations with the palliative care physician stopped chemotherapy sooner. They had one third less chemotherapy costs. They had one third fewer days in the hospital. They were much less likely to die in the hospital and much more likely to die in their home, surrounded by their loved ones, less suffering. I mean, lots and lots and lots of really good outcomes. And then the kicker was they lived 25% longer. And Atul says in his lecture, he says, if this were a drug, it would be a billion dollar drug. So what is the next thing that we're looking out for in dentistry to say, hey, what can really make a difference for our patients? And I think it's simply just the way we relate to them, the way that we can have conversations with them that really is gonna change how our patients perceive us, not only as individuals, but as a profession, and ultimately are gonna help lead them along the road to oral health. So thank you, I uh, appreciate you hanging with me, especially as the video didn't work. I will stop sharing my screen and I will kick it over to Jessica to continue on with our presentation. Okay, can everyone hear me? Yes. Wonderful. So both Paul and Matt, wow, those were really profound ideas and I was taking notes copiously. I hope um, for the rest of the audience, as well as myself, we can share our slides and continue these thought provoking ideas and these thoughtful discussions. So what I'm gonna wrap up with this afternoon is what our practice COVID-19 recovery was, our perspective, and basically how did we utilize our local community partnerships to help our patients, and as well as help our dental practice as a small business survive. And I don't have any disclosures to make in terms of I don't receive any payments from um, any companies at all. I, I own my own practice and we have four locations across Nebraska with 400 miles being between the easternmost clinic and our westernmost clinic. So in a rural state, we're very spread out, um, create some challenges, but also several opportunities. And you can go to my next slide. So here was our reality when COVID hit in Nebraska. Um, we have 47 employees, we're a five doctor practice, and by choice, about half of our practice is Medicaid. And so it really created some unique challenges for us. We were closed down seven weeks. My understanding um, from that is that was pretty good. We were one of the first states to open by proclamation of our governor. 
a couple of other things that I thought played into this is we had just recovered from a cyber attack four months prior to COVID, and this hit us the week of Thanksgiving. So you can imagine if you're a pediatric dentist or you're a general dentist, and typically that Wednesday before Thanksgiving is a no school day, your patients are really packed in. Now, all of a sudden, you don't have the ability to get your x-rays, open up your charts, bill out, schedule, et cetera. And what that crisis taught us was to really process things methodically, to maintain patience, um, to really think through what are the critical things that need to be addressed now, what things can wait until the more critical has been addressed. And then the other thing is, is I did my residency at University of Iowa. And part of my training is we were sent out to places, um, to barns, on mission trips, um, to group homes where we had to provide dental care in really less than ideal settings. And we really had to look at all the assets that we had to try to deliver that care. And so thinking outside of the box um, really was something that I could think through a little bit because of my training. We also had some good planning, I think, ahead of time, if you want to go to my next slide. And I would just also say we had some good luck. And so some of those things included um, being in a small town. So my primary practice, which is in Hastings, Nebraska, is about 25,000. We know our banker very well. We socialize with our banker. We see a lot of kids from the employees at our bank. And so when we found out from the ADA about the IDLE and the PPP loans, we requested assistance from our bank and they filed the application that weekend. Many of the employees stayed overnight and within a few days we had our loan approved and money was in our account so we could maintain some cash flow and pay our bills. We, we also have the ability to store things. We have basements under our buildings. We had about a month's worth of PPE. And so we weren't in panic mode when PPE started to become a shortage. We also had cash on hand. And that gets back to having that rainy day fund. You never know when things like this are going to hit. And you never know which bills you're going to have to pay and which ones can be deferred. And then I just also want to add, we were really fortunate that a lot of parents in our practice still trust their doctors and they trust their local health officials. And so some of the earliest parents that called and said they were ready to schedule for their kids to come back in were our parents locally that were nurses, physicians, etc. In fact, the picture here was one that you may have saw in the ADA news. These two little brothers, their mom actually works on the COVID floor in our local hospital. And so I asked if I could take a picture of her boys um, and thank her for the confidence that she showed us and showed the rest of the dental community and our community as a whole that she felt safe and comfortable bringing her boys back in for care. And then the other piece of good luck we had is our overall COVID numbers were relatively low being in rural Nebraska. Um, we do have some meatpacking plants and colleges, and so we do see outbreaks a little bit there, but not anything like what New York was seeing, Florida, California, et cetera. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, so our practice leadership team took care of a lot of the logistical things so the doctors could really focus on more of the clinical decisions that needed to be made. So for example, our practice administrator who oversees all four of our clinics, he made sure the key functions were being taken care of. The unemployment insurance was being filed on behalf of employees that were going to be using that. Our loan applications were being taken care of. Um, putting together informed consents for patients who needed treatment during COVID. And then 
I guess this might, it seems crazy now because we've all been using virtual meeting platforms, but we didn't use virtual meeting platforms except for staff meetings when we were connecting all four offices. And so he had this up and running literally the next day we were closed down. And of course, as we all know now, it's been an absolute game changer. The next thing we did is we assigned one doctor to review the science and make recommendations for the practice. And he developed six pages of reopening protocols with the citations um, under each recommendation. And as we know, this is a living document. Um, these things are changing on a week by week basis. Of course, back in March and April, they were almost changing daily. And so by keeping one person who was the hub of collecting and disseminating that information really helped keep focus for us. Um, we also asked for input on our reopening protocols from the local pediatricians in our towns and from the health department officials. And so when there was trepidation as dental offices were starting to open and who's gonna open and is it really safe, knowing that we had run our plan through the experts in our community and had them, you know, really kind of sign off on it and make suggestions of things we could do different. So for example, they said they didn't want our front staff wearing the cloth masks when our numbers were higher. They wanted them wearing the paper surgical masks and just felt that that, that would help with the spread. And then about a week before we opened, we had a two hour reopening orientation with our pediatrician and with the director of our health department. And she has a PhD um, in epidemiology and, and public health. And so having these two experts virtually in the room where our staff could ask questions and things like, okay, my biggest concern as a hygienist is bringing this virus home to my family and my kids. How am I assured that we're taking all measures so I didn't do that? And when the pediatrician explained that to him, and of course he's an opinion leader in children's health in our town, just put a lot of my staff members more at ease. And then we were also just very fortunate to apply and receive the Medicaid provider relief funds from CMS and these various layers of relief and loans and PPE and support that was coming in really helped us stay afloat and, and stay ahead of our schedule of patients. You can go to the next slide. Um, and then our doctors were really responsible for leveraging our community contacts. So for example, 10 years ago, I had sat on the board of local health. And so I knew all of the players at the health department. I knew who collected the data. I knew who was in charge of the PPE. Um, I had cell phone numbers and we really found ourselves in a position where we were getting quite a bit of um, PPE from our health department, certainly not enough to see all of our patients, but enough when shortages were coming, it helped fill in the gaps. Well, I had made the assumption that every dentist, even in our practices across the state, were getting the same amount of PPE and that wasn't the case. It was a connection that I had that um, had uh, had them reaching out to me and say, hey, we have extra, we know you guys see a lot of the poor kids in our community, can we drop that by? Um, one of our docs is chairman of our board for our local surgery center. Um, that really helped us maintain our OR time, not lose our block, um, work through some of those issues. Of course, our surgery center was closed for a period of time as well. And then one of our docs uh, works with our Medicaid contractor, MCNA, and we asked for assistance, uh, not just on behalf of our practice, but for all the dentists in the state of Nebraska that participated in Medicaid. And they said, yes, they said, we are going to tack on $10 for every unique patient visit each day that you have that is served by the Medicaid program. And $10 adds up. And so that was a huge help that we had that. They were able to support teledentistry, 
flexible time limits for recalls, things like that. And then, you know, the, just the last thing I want to mention is we turned around and tried to support our community and our small businesses. And we tried to do that in ways that were very public, uh, posted on social media, um, invited other docs and their spouses, hey, let's go to the local restaurant, let's sit outside, let's send a message to our community that we can go back and participate in some of these activities, support these business and do it in a manner that's safe and in accordance with our health department. You can go to the next slide. Um, so this is a picture of Katie, one of our hygienists. And these were some of the ways that our team leaders stepped up in creative ways. So Katie lives a little over an hour away. She commutes um, on a rural highway one way every day. And she just showed up one day right before we were seeing patients with her sewing machine. Her kids are very involved in 4-H. And she said, you know what, if these kids need to wear masks as patients and we want to save our paper masks and we're not sure if parents are going to have masks for their kids, we're just going to start our own little sweatshop downstairs and start producing these masks. And so she was doing that. We had another staff member that set up a beverage station. Uh, let me specify that was just handing out bottled water and just handing out little prizes and things for kids in a safe, non-touch way. You know, it was 100 degrees for several weeks in Nebraska when our parents were waiting in the parking lot instead of in the waiting rooms. And just having somebody bring you a cold bottle of water or a lawn chair to set out, providing yard games where families could play amongst family units. Um, and then we also had one of our hygienists um, researched and set up our first teledentistry platform. We used it for limited exams, post-op checks, and orthodontic checks. And we had a lot of bumps in the road um, that we had to work through. We're now working through that and looking how we can expand that. Obviously, because of uh, Elevate and what they've done with silver diamine fluoride, we had been using silver diamine fluoride for a number of years, but now we were using it in ways that maybe we would have put a restoration. And we just really bought into the, my goodness, there is a lot that we can delay or defer or even treat definitively with silver diamine fluoride and cut back on the amount of aerosols, uh, potentially the amount of PPE that we need to use. And we think that that will continue um, at the same rate since COVID. And then I would just say, even the smallest things, just like answering the phones every day, even when the clinic was closed, seemed to be something that was unique to um, small businesses and appreciated by parents. And I can just tell you from having a son that lives uh, in California, whose wedding had to be postponed because of all of this, I really got frustrated with the number of businesses that didn't answer their phone, wouldn't return phone calls, wouldn't return emails. And I really think having our dental team members telling a mom, I understand what you're asking. Here's what we're able to do. We don't need to see Johnny until we reopen or yes, we do. We want you to bring him in this afternoon. Just gave moms and dads and grandparents peace of mind. You can go to the next slide. Okay, so where we are today. Well, if any of you watch the um, Health Policy Institute's webinars provided by the ADA, you're going to hear uh, Marco Vuvicek and Roger Levin talk about the different phases of this COVID period in terms of the dental economics. And we're just finishing up this pent up demand phase. And now I believe we're entering into the second phase of recovery. The schedule's not as busy. It's starting to even out. I wouldn't say we have big holes that are making me nervous, but we're definitely um, scheduled less than what we would be normally scheduled this time of year. 
it's provided us some opportunity to do some projects and things that we want to do, like teledentistry. Um, this week, we have been transitioning to new practice software. It was just a perfect time to be able to do that. And then just looking at things like the recall schedule. And of course, when none of us were seeing recalls in late March and throughout April, we knew that in six months, we weren't going to have the same recalls show up in the fall. And so taking patients that were less urgent, sometimes uh, kids with Medicaid that were non, uh, very low carries risk kids and pushing them out to a fall spring recall. So if the recall was due in July, we called mom and said, would it be okay if we could move you to September or October? Not only helps us in the short room, short term, but we really needed to do that in the long term as well. We also made a more deliberate attempt to mentor our new doctors and team members. And those of you that have busy private practices, you know how it goes. You start seeing patients, you're working on various things. No one's paying attention to the new team member, the new doctor, and they really need somebody to be checking in every day. What are your questions? What kind of cases did you run into? We still have things that aren't back to normal. Like many of you, we are not back to ultrasonic scaling. Um, we have concern about hygienists that are fatigued with hand scaling. They're being asked to do more with less. Um, but new patient visits, orthodontic starts, they're coming back to normal. And I really think a lot of times it's due to the fact that parents put the needs of their kids in healthcare and spending ahead of their own. So that's kind of my hypothesis on that. Okay, next slide. And so just in conclusion, I just have a couple slides left. Um, what we've learned from all of this and moving forward is number one, we just don't take anything for granted anymore. Um, whether it is we are grateful for our parents, we are grateful for our partnerships with third party players, we are grateful for our partnership with Medicaid, with our dental associations, for companies that have provided us um, free continuing ed when we really needed that information we had the time to do it we just have paused and tried to be grateful for things and we also had to recognize dental team members they respond differently to crisis and you have to give them space to absorb that information you have to provide an outlet for them to share their concerns and it really reiter reiterated with me and our other doctors we will always aim to recruit and retain the very best team members that we can afford because it paid off in so many intangible ways. Um, when parents know that you're there for your child, they have your back. When those first parents came through our doors or um, parked in the parking lot, the first thing we said is, oh my gosh, we're so glad you're here. How do you feel about bringing your kid to the dentist? And to have them say, we know they're safe. You reached out to us. We saw what you asked us to do. And we never had a single parent when we turned their child away for elective care because of a fever or a risk factor that were upset. We said, we're here to help you. We're gonna work hard to get your child back in. We just wanna make sure everybody's safe. You know. Like all of you, we've realized there's still a lot we don't know about COVID. We don't know about uh, the aerosols, air quality controls and things like that. We're still waiting for information. How much change is that gonna require? What is it gonna cost? Is the cost gonna be per operatory? And then I just wanna say we're ready to step into the role of a dental clinic as a mass vaccination site. And if you are watching what's happening in the public health world with ADA House of Delegates resolutions, um, just like pharmacists are delivering 30% of the um, commercial vaccinations out there now, 
dentists are going to be asked as volunteers if this is something you're willing to provide so we can mass we can mass vaccinate our population quickly and then just my final slide and i'll wrap up um, you know we learned minimally invasive dentistry works very well when you when you need it to um, we also recognize that offering diverse types of dental services really helped insulate us in the economic valleys. And so that's seven weeks when we couldn't provide anything but emergency dental care, knowing that those orthodontic payments were coming in was a huge help. Would it have paid the bills? No. But did it help amongst all these other layers of revenue we had coming in? Absolutely. Um, we've learned that exploring ways to use teledentistry in general practices with school nurses and with other organizations in counties in my state that don't have a dentist is something we're looking into. And then we're looking into how do we reach out to that 7% of parents who need reassurance before they'll bring their kids back in? And how do we make them feel assured? You know, as I mentioned, we're grateful to all the companies that provided the CE, the discounted supplies, um, et cetera. But I really just want to end with this. Um, and I'm married to a physician who's an OBGYN. And so he has his own associations as well. But I can't tell you how many times he said, he said, can I see what the ADA or the AAPD put out on this? in terms of the PPP loan or the Medicaid relief. We were so fortunate that all of our dental associations that are there to support us got us good information. We trusted it was in a timely manner. And much of those funds came to dentists first. And so um, thank you very much uh, for your attention, particularly on a Friday afternoon. And I think our facilitators going to entertain questions. All right, you guys, thank you so much, Dr. Glassman, Dr. Allen, and uh, Dr. Miki. That was a great presentation with great information. And I want to quickly uh, draw everyone's attention to the little handout section on your go to webinar toolbar, where you guys can find a couple handouts to download from our pre presenters today. And then we will also be sending out a link with the recording to today's webinar, so you'll be able to re-listen and revisit any slides from today's presentation as well. We had some great feedback come through in the comment section. One um, comment that did come in was on the shared decision making, saying that they loved it. It really makes you becoming a doctor and an educator rather than a surgeon. So I just thought that was kind of a great little thing to share quickly here. And then the first question is for Dr. Glassman. It says, I always thought of teledentistry as separate from my clinic, but now I think I understand teledentistry as a new revenue stream opportunity and a way to grow my patient base, all with lowered overhead and investment required. Am I correct? And can you explain how I get started? <clears throat> well, yeah, no, I completely agree with the sentiment that was expressed and thank you, because that was the point I was trying to make as well, which is that teledentistry can have multiple positive impacts on a practice everything from um, just enhancing the in-office practice so that you have less people trooping through the office uh, and uh, being able to manage uh, actual office practice by being in touch with people before and after appointment can have huge benefits and by the preliminary, at least opinion sir, we've got so far, can actually uh, impact a lot of patients and, and make the, the office much more streamlined. But then once you get the hang of how to do that and you really develop a full service system, then, um, then, then you can really have the opportunity to move into uh, a much more distributed care system where you're impacting people that are not just people who are uh, coming into your office. You think about community sites and other places that you can begin to consider part of your community-based oral health system as opposed to just your dental office. Um, how do you get started? Well, depending on how the kind of uh, of uh, sort of, I say, bite of the apple you want to take, how big a bite, um, that uh, sometimes it's fairly simple. Some dentists are just beginning to use a video conferencing system to uh, set up video conferences, quick quick sort of responses to patients. But if you really want to do a full service system and you want to get involved, particularly in reaching out to the community, that becomes a lot more complicated. Um, I We kind of ran out of time. I was going to show a few slides about the, sort of the training uh, 
options and the training way to do training, but we don't have time for it now. So I'd say if you want to um, write to me, my contact information is available. And if you're interested in in actual uh, training or setting up a, a sort of full service system, I'm happy to talk further about it because that does require a number of considerations. It is different than uh, running a dental office, uh, dental office practice. And you think about connections with the community, the kind of, uh, of um, systems you're going to run, who the people are, what their roles are, uh, making arrangements with community sites, a, a number of things that, that uh, if you want to do it and do it well and, and be successful at it are, are good to think about. Great. Um, this question is for Dr. Miski and, and all as well, but if phase one of pent-up demand is now turning to phase two of this recovery, what should we expect in phase two and how long will our recovery last? <laughs> well, that's a good question for the dental economist and I'm not one, um, but what I would <laughs> encourage you to do is to visit the ADA's website and click on the Health Policy Institute webpage and listen to some of the webinars that are on there. Um, I have also listened to and looked up a lot of the information on Roger Levine's website, um, but he he talks in depth about these three distinct phases of recovery, and it sounds like um, phase three will start to come back. It'll be a little more slow, a little more methodical, but that we really need to plan on this whole dental economic recovery being more like 18 months as opposed to when we all got shut down, we thought, ah, oh, things will be back up and normal by June. So I would just encourage um, the audience to look at those two websites. I really respect both of those gentlemen as experts in the area of dental economics. And I would just add that uh, I don't have any more of a crystal ball than anyone else does. And so I think in terms of the economic data, um, I agree uh, with Jessica about that uh, ADA is really doing a good job of that. But I think it's fair to say that uh, we're not going back to the uh, what I now refer to as ancient times, which was last January. We're not going back to that world. Uh, I mean, and we may get closer to it than than we have been during the acute phases of COVID, like we are now. But the idea of not having to pay attention to uh, airborne infections in the future, I don't see us moving away from that. And it seems to me that the kind of modifications and opportunities that we have to think differently about, um, again, the phrase community engaged dental care systems, where we can uh, not be as efficient in, in the office practice as we might have been in the past because of the increased attention we have to pay, but really begin to take advantage of the opportunities that minimally invasive dentistry, all of the new medications and materials, the communication systems that Matt talked about, the ability to reach people outside of the office. I think those are going to be huge opportunities going forward. So I think if someone, if, if I don't know what the question exactly meant, but if it meant how long is the recovery going to last? Like, when are we going to get back the way it was uh, last year? I don't think we're going back there. So I think it really behooves everyone to start to think about uh, a, a future that is actually going to be better for everyone, better for dental practices and better for the population as a whole. Yeah, and one thing I'll just follow up with that was on um, the Health Policy Institute's webinar is um, they they uh, quoted, and I can't remember, it was a company that does consumer surveys, but really large numbers of responses. And it was something like seven to ten percent of patients that normally go visit a dentist are not going to come back until there has been a vaccination or until the virus has been eliminated. And then there's another chunk above that that would come back to see their dentist as long as they were reassured by their dentist it was safe. And so we really just need to keep hoping that when the vaccination is ready and it's safe to be administered, that we'll be in that first 20 million of doses so we and our dental teams can get vaccinated and then more of the population to follow. And I think that's when that last group of patients will be coming back. Um, also, maybe we're thinking about even if we have a vaccine next year, that the uh, hallmark for the FDA to approve a vaccine is that 50% of people become immune. So that should give us something to think about, right? It doesn't mean we're going to be out of this instantly back to back to where we were last year. Yeah, and I would say too that uh, you know. COVID has obviously disrupted payment systems in such a way that insurers are, you know, like Dr. Miski mentioned, you know, changing quickly to cover things that they haven't in the past and whatnot. And so I think that there, 
uh, flexibility even in this time is going to help them see enough people who are willing to try different and new things that will actually show differences in patient oral health. And so, like Dr. Glassman just said, going back to the way things were, even if all of our patients you know, come back, we will probably be caring for them differently or thinking about different things when they do come back because we've simply seen examples of other ways that have worked because of this great disruption, which uh, you know, I, call it, I call it a kairos moment. Uh, in, in ancient Greek, there was two words for, for time. One was chronos, so like what time is it on the clock, and kairos, which is essentially an opportunity. And I think that we have the opportunity as a profession to use this as a kairos moment to help us move forward in ways that really do promote oral health for our patients. Great. Another one to kind of elaborate on that. Um, I heard mention of the impact we all can have with third party payers and our governing bodies advocating for things like payments for added costs of PPE, relaxation of rules around teledentistry, et cetera. What actionable and practical suggestions do you all have for this audience to do regarding this advocacy? You know, I'll just mention that in the uh, panel, uh, the control panel for the webinar, uh, I've posted two different documents that address policy issues. So um, if you're interested in, in uh, doing what you can to try and advance policy in your state to allow the things we've been talking about to happen, suggest you get one of them as a white paper I, that I <clears throat> wrote for DentaQuest last year, which is now very timely about teledentistry. And it gives a little bit more explanation about teledentistry systems than we've had a chance to delve into today. But it also has a section about advancing policy. And then there's a second one, which is specifically if you're in a position to work with your dental association, or maybe you even have some influence on legislative policy in your state or can be uh, presenting to a coalition that might be interested, or sometimes uh, children's advocacy groups or other groups are very interested in these things. It's a suggestion for the rules. If, if you could say, what are the what are the rules that you want to put in place now for how to support teledentistry and minimally invasive dentistry and the new ideas we've been talking about? Here's a suggestion for how to present that to your policymakers of what kind of rules would be what would be useful and important. And I think uh, I would say never discount your ability, even as a single dentist or hygienist, or whoever else is on the line as a single individual to make a difference. I think a lot of people think that um, policy and rules and regulations are in some other, take place on some other universe and we don't have a chance as individuals to influence them. It's really not true. Uh, and I think you can do a lot by just getting in contact with the right people and helping them understand what we need and what's gonna make a difference and being able to, uh, as I always say, make some friends, get other groups that also believe in improving the health of the population to work with you. There's a lot that can be done. I also have something I can add as a resource. If you just go to your Google browser and type ADA interim guidance to coding and billing, they have produced a wonderful resource that will go through every insurance plan that they were able to make contact with in the country and tell you what are their rules on PPE assistance, are they paying for teledentistry, are they extending frequency limits, and they have a nice neat resource that gets updated every week that you can print. Once you have the information of whom in your state pays for what, then you wanna work with your state dental association to assure that you have a dentist on the board or on the advisory committee for every one of those third party payers in an ideal world. Uh, we don't have one in Nebraska on every single um, third party payer, but that is something we're striving for. And I would say, you know, look, even looking at places during the pandemic, like I think it was Texas and New York, where it's not just, hey, we need more money for PPE, but those places came and said, we're going to cover SDF now. Um, things like that to say, what kinds of things are going to be applicable in the new world? And let's push and strive for those kinds of changes. In addition to teledentistry, I think, you know, we've, we've talked about a number of different ones here as well. Uh, there are ways that we can start to say, it's not only can you give us more for doing some of the same things that we are different because we have to do it differently, but we're, we're practicing differently now and that should be reflected in uh, the way that we are getting paid. Great, all right, we have one last question here. It says, what do you tell educated patients that know non-emergency dentistry is not recommended by who at this time in areas of uncontrolled spread? Can you repeat that question, Haley? 
Yeah, I'm not sure I understood the question. I sure can here. It says, what do you tell educated patients that know non-emergency dentistry is not recommended by the World Health, World Health Organization at this time in areas of uncontrolled spread? Gotcha. So the WHO came out and said, that article that came out a little while ago that said, essentially, we, we don't recommend not going for non-emergent things. Um, yeah, what what do we say to those patients? I think Jessica referenced the, uh, the data that... Uh, um, the ADA Health Policy Institute has been talking about in their biweekly webinars about the difference in the population and, and number of people who are already going back. Other people were just prepared to go back. And then there's that uh, 15 or so percent that are really hesitant. Some of them are just not going back. But then there's there's other ones with maybe I think is what was just described in the question of people who, you know, they're really nervous about going back. And um, and uh, I think that, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're starting to see um, actually some interesting data really non-data about the fact that there's not outbreaks that are coming out of dental offices and there was a lot of concern about that dentists dental offices i have some data in some of my slides showing uh, back in march there were studies that looked at who's at the greatest risk for COVID, and they listed people in dental offices as a number way off the chart uh, dentists hygienists and assistants because of all the aerosol producing procedures but it turns out that the data is not showing passage of COVID in dental offices and uh, I attribute that to all of the precautions that people are taking and the PPE and the fact that we're being careful as an industry and doing the right things that we don't see a huge passage of, uh, of, uh, of COVID in dental offices. Now, you know, it does slow down production. You got to continue to do all that stuff. I don't think any of that's going away, but I think helping people understand that, continuing to get the word out about it, and then also helping them understand that we have ways of doing less aerosol producing procedures, all the minimally invasive stuff, um, clearly, the communication techniques that Matt was talking about are critical. So I think all those things add up to helping people understand that we've got a world now where we can actually produce better oral health um, and do it in a, in a safer way than maybe was the situation previously. Yeah, I would I would add that you know if if the World Health Organization is taking dentistry as you have to have a drill in your hand and you have to be sitting in a dental chair to essentially be be you know on the receiving end of of dental work um, that you know we we know that that's not true obviously and so if if we only imagine ourselves as surgeons with a handpiece uh, then yeah maybe you know it's you know I, I still think we could probably do a lot obviously we are. Uh, but I do think that there are so many ways, especially, so that's what I would say to an educated patient. If, if we know that those other ways out are out there to say, hey, look, like one of, the one of the ways that we can help you stay healthy is just by having a really good conversation about what you value and what you're doing at home and what you might want to do, uh, especially during this time, you know, that can produce health. And even if we don't get paid for that right now, those are partnership and relationship building um, activities that promote long-term practice sustainability. Obviously, you need short-term practice uh, you know, strategies to help you make it through right now if all of your patients aren't back in the office. Uh, but we're also in the long game here, and we want to make sure that our patients are coming back long-term. We want to ensure that we walk away from this situation with our reputation enhanced because we did the right thing and patients can trust us instead of simply trying to maybe you know, take what's right in front of us, even if it's not the right thing to do. So um, hopefully those are, you know, some, some ways that we can have have conversations with those patients that and allow us to to really build that long game. Well, Haley, thank you for uh, handling the questions. And uh, we've come to the 90 minute mark. Uh, thank you, Dr. Glassman, Alan and Miski for a wonderful presentation. And uh, thank you all for joining. Dr. Miski, as a, as, as a note, I've been on every one of the ADA HPI webinars, I highly recommend them. Uh, I think the last stat I saw was 14% of patients, which is why we're kind of gliding into this 86% recovery. It's about 14% that are seeking either vaccination or breakthrough therapy, and they're not coming back until then. It's about 7% are, that are insurance seekers. Uh, so I'd highly recommend to everybody listening right now that it's a good time to send an email out to your patient base assuring safety because uh, there are people waiting to come to the office for that. I just went last week and I was highly uh, thankful of the appointment. And it was it was different, but it was very good. And I recommend it to anybody. So to our guests, remember your CE certificate will be emailed uh, to all attendees in two hours. Don't forget to check your uh, spam folder. Uh, the third note that you see there, Dr. Allen has a series of videos that he presented. One of those, uh, we just didn't hear the, the audio on. All of those videos are at that link that you see on the screen. So I'll keep talking a little bit. So if you want to access those videos that Dr. 
Alan talked about, they're all on that screen. Uh, the link you also see on the screen gives you access to our archived uh, webinars, the www.elevatoralcare.com backslash elevating care. So on the topics that Dr. Allen and Dr. Glassman spoke on for 20 minutes, they each have full webinars on our site that are free CE with exam. Uh, so we encourage you to go there and look for those webinars. Uh, this webinar will be uploaded within about a week and on that site, uh, we're gonna be sending you all an email following this that'll link you to those webinars and we will likely send you a uh, sheet of the slides from this presentation that are set up as an outline form. So you'll have a copy of those, along with that link to Dr. Uh, Allen's slides and the other video slide libraries that we have. Um, so everybody, thank you very much and have a very safe and wonderful weekend. Thank you all.